Praise the Lord. Can we turn to Second Corinthians? Chapter 7. Second Corinthians chapter 7. Starting with verse 8. Even if I caused you sorrow by my letter, I do not regret it. Though I did regret it, I see that my letter hurt you, but only for a little while. Yet now I'm happy, not because you are not sorry, but because you, your sorrow led you to repentance. For you became sorrowful as God intended, and so were, so were not harmed in any way by us. Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret. But worldly sorrow brings death. See what this godly sorrow has produced in you. What earnestness, what eagerness to clear yourself. What indignation, what alarm, what longing, what concern, that readiness to see justice done. Every point you have proved yourself to be innocent in this matter. So even though I wrote to you, it was not on account of the one who did the wrong or of the injury party, but rather that before God you could see, your, see yourself uh, how devoted to us you are. By all this, we are encouraged. In addition to, all, to your own encouragement, we were especially delighted to see how happy Titus was because his spirit has been refreshed by all of you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you and praise you for this time. We thank you that we are gathered in this place in your name. We thank you yeah, that you are present here with us. And we pray that Spirit of God will convict our hearts this afternoon so that if there are any unconfessed sins in our lives, may we confess our sins so that we may repent. Turn around from the sins so that we may be more like Christ. And as we learn about repentance, enlighten us, illuminate this portion of Scripture to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As I was talking to many people uh, through past few weeks, as well as many years in uh, college, few years in college ministry, that I realized that this teaching is very important. Uh, I felt the pressing need to talk about what repentance is. Repentance. Because many of us have misconception of what it means to repent our sins, confess our sins, and change our lives, and what is relation to confessing our sins and changing that process of repentance. What does it, uh, what does it mean? And many people are confused about that. So um, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about repentance. If some of you, maybe, maybe some of you in here don't ever feel guilty, you, you don't feel guilty at all. And there are different kinds of people and different kinds of conscience that we have. And some people don't feel guilty. I don't think I'm a sinner. I don't think I, I sin in my life. Bible seems to say that we sin all the time and we are born as a sinner and we sin all the time. Although we are saved, now we are not sinners anymore, but we do sin in our lives. How, what, how does that work? I'm not, I don't feel guilty anymore. I mean, I don't do major things in my life. I don't uh, try to murder somebody. You know, I don't feel that guilty. Maybe some of you feel like that then message will be applicable to you. Maybe some of you, some of you say you don't have a passion for God. If we really understand what Christ has done for us, we should have passion and love for God. And you don't really have a passion. It's a matter of repentance. Okay? So if you do not have a genuine passion, love, undivided 
emotion and devotion. I think there's definitely something wrong there, and this teaching will perhaps be helpful to you. Uh, maybe some of you, some of you are like this. Some of, some of you are depressed all the time. Your position on your bed is downward all the time, sitting down and face down yourself, thinking about all the things that you have done, and you feel like you are, and you feel and you look like the person who's carrying all the sins of this world. You feel too guilty, you feel bad, you get depressed all the time. And whenever somebody mentions anything negative towards you, you feel so guilty that I don't need another, you know, guilt in my uh, body because one more I'll go down to help. So I don't need to feel this. Maybe some of you feel like that. Maybe some of you feel like you have committed one sin that you cannot be forgiven. There's some sin, some, there's always people like that. Talking to people not, is not abnormal, that abnormal. Somebody says, I cannot be forgiven of, forgiven of certain sin because I committed this sin, and certainly this is, this is the unforgivable sin. Maybe this message will be helpful to you. Maybe some of you are not a Christian. Maybe there's somebody here who's not a Christian. Well, this message will be helpful to you. So let's talk about it. Let's talk about repentance. I want to talk about repentance in a lecture format. We're going to look into different kinds of verses in the scripture so that we may understand what it means to repent. It'll be very helpful. So we'll, div we'll talk about five things concerning repentance. First of all, meaning of repentance. Secondly, reason for repentance. Thirdly, perspective. What perspective should I have through the scripture? So I understand the meaning. Okay, I need to repent. What kind of perspective do I have? Do I have to have in terms of repentance? Fourthly, we're going to talk about proof. If you genuinely repented, what happens? Proof or result of repentance. Last but not least, practice. Some practical suggestions. Okay. So, looks like we're headed for a long message here. Three uh, points usually takes hour, but five points. So we have to calculate here. Okay, ten minutes each. So we'll try to finish in less than an hour. First of all, meaning. What does what does repentance mean? The word repentance. The word uh, in Greek use Greek word to mean repentance means. Uh, metanoia mean you don't have to know that word, but I'm just saying it to impress you. <laughs> Greek word metanoia, or Hebrew word shu means change of mind. Change of mind. Or we can say change of opinion. Change of mind and change of opinion. Another word that I, want, I would like to mention, another Hebrew word, Naham or Naham, just to impress you. Also used <coughs> for the word comfort, uh, where repentance means comfort. Okay, comfort. So change of mind, change of opinion. Another word that can be added there is comfort. So how, how does it all together and what does it mean? It refers to adopting a different viewpoint of something. So when you change your mind about something, now you see something different way. So it refers to adopting a certain view, different view about something. Okay? So change your mind, change of opinion occurs. So in that sense, it's, it's about seeing, seeing something in a different manner. Seeing something with different eyes. Okay? So put that all together. We realize that as you go to God in repentance to confess, as God gives, and when we confess our sins, when we go to God and when we confess our sins, deepest secrets of our lives, it gives us different eyes. So you see everything differently. So, which result in comfort. So when you go to, when you repent, you go to God, you repent your sins, now you come back out of Prayer, you see everything different way, which gives us comfort. Okay? That's all, that always has to happen when we repent our sins. For example, what, 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 what do I, what do I mean? Different view or different way to think about something. For example, for, uh, when you repent your sins as a, as a, as a non-believer, when, if you're a non-believer, if you're not a believer, and you see, uh, 
a sinner and you think about hell, concept of hell, going to heaven and things like that. Going to heaven you can understand, but going to hell, how can a loving God send somebody into hell? Maybe some of you are Christians and you're thinking about something like that, right? Now, we think of it like that because we don't know who we are. We don't know what kind of sinner we are according to Scripture. Now, when we repent our sins, when we genuinely understand what kind of person we are, what kind of people we are, what kind of person I am, what kind of sinner that I am according to what the Scripture describes, then your viewpoint changes. It becomes reasonable that we go to hell. Why? If I realize what kind of unbelievable sinner that I am, then we realize it's reasonable for me to go to hell. Then question is not, how can God send us into hell? But the question is, how can God save us? It gives, it gives different viewpoint. How can amazing and awesome God save a sinner like me? Then you can sing songs like Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound, that saved a wretch like me. You can sing it with all your heart and tears. Even though you are saying, talk, talking about yourself that I'm a wretched sinner, it should make us feel bad, but it gives us joy, comfort, just like the definition says. Another, some, another way to this, another way to illustrate that is as we genuinely repent our sins, that we have a different viewpoint is that maybe some of you have major problem concerning lust. And if you truly confess your sins and, and repent your sins before God, now your viewpoint changes. Someone, uh, when you see a beautiful girl, you are, when you lust have some somebody, you are seeing that person as a sex object, an object. But according to scripture, when we repent our sins, now viewpoint changes through the uh, explanation of the scripture, information of the scripture. Now that someone who you, you used to see as a sex object, now is changed to a soul, a person. And you see a person in a different manner, and it's, Difficult for you to lust after after somebody. I'm not saying it's com you can completely be free from that. I'm not saying that. Okay, that we cannot be completely free from sin, or completely in this life. I'm going to talk about that later. But that viewpoint changes as you repent. More and more, you see people as someone who has image of God and a person. Someone who used to hate people. Different view of change and change of viewpoint and what you think. Another explanation is when you see somebody you, you used to hate, right? You want to beat that person up and when that, whenever that person walks by, you have that lower stomach feeling, butterfly in your, in your stomach and you just don't want, don't like to be there with them. And you feel like that. If you tru truly repent your sins before God, that person is not an, someone you hate or object of hate. But now that person becomes needy rather than someone you hate. That person becomes needy. For example, when Jesus was dying on the cross, he sees an enemy right in front of his face as somebody is putting him to the, bring the nail through his hands. As he's dying on the cross, what does Jesus say? Jesus doesn't see that person as someone to hate, but Jesus sees that person as, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. How is Jesus seeing that person? Seeing that person as someone need more information concerning what they are doing. They are needy. They don't know what they're doing. Whenever you see somebody you hate, Bible says love them. How can we love them if we don't see them? If we change our views as God enables us, if we change our views, change our thinking, if we see them as someone who needs the love of Jesus Christ, someone who needs no Christ rather than someone who hates me, someone I should hate, then everything changes. So repentance means change your mind, change your opinion. Change of eyesight, change of our eyes, how we view things, how we view people, how we view ourselves, how we view sin, and having God's eyes in a way that as we repent our sins before God, it gives us comfort. Secondly, let's talk about reason for repentance. Wow, I did that in 10 minutes. Reason for repentance here. For what reason do we need to repent? Okay. For what reason do we need to change? For what reason do we need to confess our sins? When I say repent, repentance, I like to include that whole process going to, usually when we say, let's repent our sins, usually we are just talking about the confessing part. 
saying, I am sorry for this sin. And we turn around and we think that we repented. But that process of repentance is different in the Bible. When we see the definition and the process of repentance, it's not just confessing our sins, Lord, I'm sorry, but that process afterwards of changing, having different behavior, not only seeing it differently, but having different behavior is all included in that process of repentance. So uh, repentance, when I say repentance, it's not just a confession, but change of views and change of life as well. That whole process is repentance. So what, for what reason should we repent? I'd like to address the two crowds. First crowd is unbeliever. So why does unbeliever has to repent? Why does someone who does not trust in Jesus Christ alone for salvation has to repent? Because of salvation for eternal, salvation from eternal separation from God, as you know. Salvation from eternal separation from God. Hell is, of course, ultimate culmination of the separation from God. But not only going to hell, but even in this moment, as we are separated from God, we don't experience joy, peace, happiness, and all the good things that comes from God. Not only you don't experience that, but ultimately for eternity, in pain and suffering and sorrow, you'll be spending your time in a place called hell, eternally separated from God. That unbeliever has to repent if you are not a believer in Jesus Christ because God is holy and God is just. And that holiness, because of His love, which is part of His character, who He is, being a just judge, holy God, has to punish sin. And a sinner that is so involved in sin of course, as we look into the scripture, he provides a way out by trusting Jesus alone for salvation, believing that he died in place of us, right, can save an unbeliever. And all the believers who are in here were once unbeliever, but we believe that, you know, we believe that we are saved by atonement of Jesus Christ, by Jesus Christ replacing us on the cross. I believe as we look into the scripture, man is totally depraved. Let me explain the concept. What is What does it mean by total depravity? Totally depraved. Not utterly depraved, but totally depra depraved. There's a difference. Okay? Totally depraved, utterly depraved. Because we ask the question all the time and say, why sometimes does, does, is non-Christian better person than I am? Why is non-Christian? Sometimes some non-Christians are better than uh, Christians. Right? Non-Christians. Well, uh, perhaps this concept explains. Utter depravity is meaning, when we say we, someone is utterly depraved, we mean someone is as bad as they can be. Hey, we don't mean, we don't believe in utter depravity. We're not saying everybody sins in a way that they are as bad as they can be. No, we don't believe that. But we believe, believe in total depravity, meaning all the spheres and areas of, of a person, all the sphere and area, mind, soul, body, and all the things that they do, intention and motive, all the aspect is distorted by sin. So even though that may, the person may be pretty good person in comparison to others, still in to eyes of holy and just God, all the areas of that person, sphere of that person, is depraved in sin. We believe in total depravity. And every man, even though as nice as they can be, in the eyes of perfect God, holy, perfectly moral, holy God, everybody is totally depraved. So he cannot help. A sinner who's not cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ cannot help but to go to hell because God is perfectly holy. Only if he's covered by the blood of God's own Son uh, he can be saved. So that's the reason why unbeliever has to repent. Okay? As God allows realization of your own sin and His holiness, that you need to go to the cross and put your guilt and shame and penalty, sin, before the cross as He dressed you with His blood, that you can be clean in the sight of God. Need to do that if you are not a, if you are an uh, unbeliever. Now let's address to, address to another crowd of crowd, which is many of us believers. Hey, okay? believers, why does believer have to repent? We believe that as we go to the cross, 
once for all, if we go to the cross and say, Lord, I'm sorry for my sins. I'm a sinner before God. And I cannot help but to be, but, but to go to you for salvation. I give all my sins, all my past sins, all my, all my present sins, all my future sins. I lay it before the cross. Will you take it away and come into my heart, come into my life and live with me? And God does that. Meaning, we believe that God cleanses us from all the sins, not only of past or present or even future, all the sins we will commit, we believe at the point of salvation, we believe we are clean before God. Then why in the world do we need to repent our sins? Okay? Presently, as a believers in Jesus Christ, didn't we, weren't we, uh, didn't, uh, didn't God forgive us from all the sins that we already will commit? Didn't we confess our sins when we are saved? Yes, you did. But, when, when a believer repents, okay, it's not a matter of salvation being saved in terms of being salvation, but it's a matter of sanctification. It's a matter of growth. In order for you to grow, you need to repent. It's not for salvation when a believer repents sins. We want to appropriate the forgiveness that we already have received at the point of salvation, point of, uh, you know, sinner's prayer when we confess our sins. Now we appropriate that when we repent our sins now so that we can grow in our spiritual life to have a clearer vision. It blurs our vision if we have our sins, our spiritual vision. So we can't grow. We can, we cannot have progress in this pilgrim's journey because our vision is blurred and we go to all the other places while Jesus says, I am the way. We cannot go to the way that God wants us to go. That means we cannot grow spiritually. Yes, positionally, when we repent our sins, initially, when we confess our sins to God, when we are saved, positionally, God sees us through the blood of Jesus Christ in terms of salvation. But sin can still affect us spiritually in terms of spiritual growth if we don't confess our sins. Thus, we must repent our sins and grow continuously. We're talking about subjective cleansing. When we have guilt and sins in our, in our minds and in our hearts, it it stops us from growing. So we repent our sins daily, every day, so that we can grow in this process of sanctification and being more like Christ and experience the joy that God has in store for us. I'm doing a good job here. Less than 20 minutes, two points down. Two down, three to go. Third point is a perspective. Now, this may be a little difficult to do it in 10 minutes. Perspective. Now, we need to have some different perspective. Because we have wrong perspective concerning repentance. Because, as I said in the beginning, many people in terms of repentance have bad feelings about it. I got to feel bad. This is your reaction, right? But this is not a biblical way of repenting, but this is how you feel most of it. Now, I got to repent. I got to repent. So what do I do? I got to get down on my knees. It's got to hurt my knees. It's got to hurt my knees. It's, I got to pound my chest because it's got to hurt me. I got to pinch myself or something because it's got to, it's got to do something. So I have to feel bad. I got to do this and then sometimes hit my nose or something. It's got to bleed in order for me to repent. So I'll do that. I got to feel bad. So you say to yourself, I'm the worst person. I'm the scum of the earth. I'm the worst person. I'm the worst of the sinner. You say to yourself as, as to uh, convince yourself you are a bad person so that you will feel bad so you can repent. No. Some of you think that you have to cry. So, you know, sometimes you, you just have to bite your tongue or something like that to cry. Have the tear running down your, or yawn or something so that you can have the tear running down your, your cheek and say, I did repent. I did my job today. Or slap yourself. Whatever you have to tell somebody else to slap you or something. No, that is not how you do it. Somebody, somebody thinks that I have to be loud when I repent. So I have to do that. So, no. That is not right way of repenting. Because as we look into the scripture, repentance is not self-generated. Okay? Repentance is not self-generated. You don't cause yourself to repent as we look into the scripture. Nothing in Christianity is self-dependency. Okay? Nothing you can do out of self-dependency. You cannot do anything generated by yourself. You, you cannot generate repentance on your own. It's a response of God's grace. So let's, we need to have some different perspective concerning uh, repentance. I'm going to talk about three perspectives. First perspective is this. The way you view repentance ought to be, first of all, it has to be God-generated. It has comes from God. God-generated. 
Not self-generated. God-generated. God gives us repentance. It's seeing with God's given vision. Right? That's why in this text, in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, it's talking about godly sorrow. Right? God-given sorrow. Guilt. Right? Is God-given means of yellow light. Think about that. Right? Some of you feel guilty. And that's, sometimes if you have false guilt, that, that is not good. You shouldn't be guilty about something, but you should, you're guilty, that is not good. But if you're guilty because you've sinned, that is good because it's God-given means of yellow light. It's a God-given means of dead end sign. It's God-given give, means of warning. I'm warning you, you gotta change, otherwise you're gonna fall. Don't run into the fire. And God speaks to you like that many times through conscience. So at times this even guilt is God given thing. Right? Second Timothy chapter two verse twenty five said this. I'll just read it. We don't have time to find it. So I'll just read it. Second Timothy chapter two, verse twenty five. You can write it if you're writing the notes. Second Timothy chapter two, verse twenty five. It says this. Those who oppose him, he must gently instruct. We're talking about someone who's opposing ministers or pastors or something like that. And uh Paul is giving Timothy, if someone opposes you. Right? You ought to treat him like this. If someone sins, you ought to treat like this. Those who oppose him, he must gently instruct in hope that God will grant them repentance. Did you hear that? God will grant them repentance. Repentance there is not self-generated. It's granted by God, given by God, leading them to the knowledge of truth. So it is God-given thing. God has to generate this. Also, Romans chapter 2, verse 4. If you read it, it says this. It's a popular song. You know the verse very well. You heard of it. Did you know it was in Romans chapter 2, verse 4? It says, it's your kindness that leads you toward repentance. It's your kindness, kindness that leads you toward repentance. Somehow, when we experience the kindness of God, love of God, awesome, amazing, indescribable love of God. It melts our hearts in a way that I need to repent. And it's the kindness of God that leads to repentance. When we talk about that kind of love, kindness of God, that leads you to repent, repentance, a lot of times we think that, ah, it's the kindness of God. So we cannot preach about holiness of God. We cannot teach about, teach about righteousness of God because, you know, it's a kindness of God that leads to repentance. But if you look at the context of Romans chapter 2, kindness there talking about God is patient as to not to send you into hell right now. Let's talk about that kind of context. God is not, the reason why we're sitting in the pew is because God may let you have chair under your behind. Right? Not only that, reason why we are not going to hell is because there's something underneath our feet that holds us. That's caused by God. Otherwise, we'll be right down going into hell. Within that context, this verse is saying, see, it's kindness of God. He's not letting you go to hell right now. It's the kindness of God, forbearance of God, patience of God that leads us to repentance. He waits and waits as He causes us to repent and if we respond with, we respond to the truth in a way that as we repent, you see, it's that kind of kindness of God that leads us to repentance. We're not talking about mushy love here or marshmallow type of love here, but we're talking about holy love of God. Yes, we need to, we need to preach the holiness of God. We need to preach sin and, and then also talk about the love of God so that they may realize, people may realize and you may realize and I may realize that it's that kind of kindness, holy love of God, that leads us to repentance. So in response to that perspective that God generated repentance, we need to ask God so that we can repent. Do you understand that? We need to say, as if you want to repent your sins before God, you have to go to the Lord and say, Lord, help me to repent. I need to understand what kind of sinner I am. I need to understand who you are so that I may see the wonderful grace that you have poured down upon me. I need to understand that. Second perspective that we need to understand about repentance is this. Okay? Second perspective concerning repentance. Not only is it God-generated, but it's something positive. It is something 
positive. Repentance is not something negative. And when somebody tells you to repent, all the televisions that we see, all the uh, media and all these things, all these places, when we talk about someone who tells in this manner, repent, you sinners, you son of vipers, or something like that, and they always have that kind of picture of preachers on TV. Well, what they say might be right, but they might be saying in a wrong manner. But always media and this world and the televisions and the movies misrepresent what it really means. But as we talk about repentance, it's with a lot of love. It's something positive. Okay? It is something positive because it's the love of God, kindness of God that leads us to repentance. So why do we feel bad? There are some reasons why we feel bad when we uh, repent our sins. Okay? Let's look into this text carefully. Second Corinthians, what is this saying? Basically, Paul wrote letter to Corinthians in Second Corinthians chapter 7 because they were doing so bad. They were in sins. So Paul basically wrote letters uh, before Second Corinthians to yell at them, rebuke them in the Spirit of God with a lot of love. So verse 8, it says, even if what, what happened was it caused sorrow, bad feeling in the people, at least temporarily. So verse 8, it says that even if I cause sorrow by my letter, I do not regret it, though I did regret it. So at first, at first he regretted a little bit because it caused some sort of sorrow to people. I always feel like that when I tell people to repent and this is wrong, this is wrong, I go home and cry because I know that that person is going to be hurt. Then I, as much as I can, I pray for them. I make sure that I, I am not rejecting their person, but I'm rejecting their sin. Not rejecting their person. I'm not rejecting anybody. I still care for them. That's why I'm saying this. Not because I hate them. I don't associate them with sin. I care for them, so I talk about sin. So sometimes I feel bad. And that's, I can understand how Paul feels here. It says, though I regret it, I see that my letter hurt you. That's why he, he regretted a little bit in the beginning. But only for a little while. Verse 9. Yet now I'm happy. Why is he happy? Not because you were made, made sorry, but because your sorrow led you to repentance. For you became sorrowful as God intended, so were not ashamed in any way by us. And then he compares two kinds of sorrow. Verse 10, he says, godly sorrow, that's a repentance. That's a genuine repentance. And worldly sorrow, that's feeling bad. Okay? Godly sorrow, he says, brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret. Verse 10, worldly sorrow brings death. Okay? And then, you know, it compares worldly sorrow and godly sorrow. We're going to talk a little bit about that a little later. But why do you feel bad? Because it's a worldly sorrow. What does it mean by worldly sorrow? It's a self-dependence, basically self-dependency. You feel bad, and you want to feel bad. You are sorry, you are sorry that it happened, so you feel bad. But in order for you to take care of that, you cannot do anything about it, except to go to the cross and give it to Jesus. But thing is, you feel bad because you want to hold it, you want to take care of it on your own. And that's why you feel bad. Whenever you repent, go to, conf go to the Lord to confess your sins, you should never hold it and never should feel bad. It's something positive as you go to the Lord. It's, it's something that is good. Because there is no other answer to take care of guilt that you have, sorrow that you have, unless you go to the cross. I can compare godly sorrow and worldly sorrow in this way. It's perfect illustration is difference between Judas Judas Iscariot, who sold Jesus for 30 pieces of silver and committed suicide, versus Peter, basically committed the same sin. He sold Jesus through his confession. I never knew him. I never knew him. Not 30 pieces of silver, but for his pride. That, and for his life, he uh, committed that sin of selling Jesus. Now, Judas, what did he do? After he sold Jesus 30 pieces of silver, he became guilt, guilty. He even cried. He became very sorrowful. He even goes to the priest and throws 30 pieces of silver at him and say, what can I do? What does he do? He takes care of his sorrow and guilt with his own hand. He commits suicide. He kills himself. That's self-dependency. Why do you feel bad? Because you think you can take care of your sorrow on your own. 
Because repentance, in repentance, biblical repentance, you should never feel bad when you go to repent your sins. Okay? I mean, you should feel bad because you feel guilty about your sin. And when you go to the Lord and confess your sin to repent, you shouldn't feel bad because there's something positive. However, when you talk about Peter, right, it did not end there. He knew that he cannot do anything. Later on, what does he do? He had to go to Jesus, and Jesus forgives him. So he becomes a wonderful servant of God. And because when we look into the scripture, godly sorrow always produces something good. Think of it like this. It's a key to your spiritual growth. Isn't that something positive? If you go to the Lord with guilt, and when you get down on your knees and pray to the Lord, think about it. Now you're going to spiritually grow. How can you feel bad about that? Not only that, it's a key in being used by God. Someone like Peter can be used by God. When Isaiah melted like jello before God, and as he repented his sins, and say, I'm a man of sin. I live among the people of sins. As he repented his sin before God, now after Isaiah chapter 6, he can be used by God. Think of it like this. It's a key to the treasure of God. Let's say there's this door behind the cross. There's this door. And there's no way you cannot enter it. You feel guilty, you feel bad, because it's your sin that stops you from going through that door. You're too fat with sin. But as you go to the cross, you repent your sins. And that repentance is a key. God gives, I'll, I'll, now you repent. He gives you a key. And now you repent. You put all your sins upon the cross. And now you open the door. Through the repentance, now you can go into that door of the cross and you have this wonderful grace and mercy, kindness, treasures of God. Everything and anything you can imagine. Diamonds, gold, emeralds. I don't know any more uh, <laughs> things. Ladies, help me out here. <laughs> and all the wonderful things. Food for guys. Pizza, whatever it is. All the good things you can imagine. It's a key. Repentance is a key to open the door of treasures of heaven. How can you feel bad about that? You should never feel bad. When you go to repent, you're opening that door of God's wonderful blessing. Think about it. It's a key to empty your filth. And God will fill you till your cup overflows. It always leads me to joy. Whenever I repent, I, I always repent. I repent all the time. I confess my sins all the time. Every time I sit down, that's what I do. Lord, I'm sorry. You know, every time after Sunday service, as I'm driving back home, as I'm going home, Lord, I'm sorry. I did not prepare enough. I preached too long. You know, I, I'm sorry I did not do a good job. I did not do 100%. I did not give 100%. A couple people fell asleep. Sorry for being boring. You know, I have to repent for all these things. But you know, as I repent, I'm free. I, I feel, I always have joy because I know I'm closer to the Lord. Do you know that if you, as you repent your sins, you get closer to the Lord? There's layers of layers of layers of sins laid upon us in our conscience. And as you, one by one, we take care of that repentance, we get closer to the Lord. Psalm 24, verse 3, 4. Let's look at that. That's an important place. So put your pinky in Second Corinthians and go to Psalm 24. And you underline it every time you don't feel like repenting and you feel bad when you feel, when you repent. Psalm 24, verse 3, 4, 5. I think we looked at it somewhere, but we're going to look at it again because it's such a good verse. Psalm 24, verse 3, 4, and 5. Let me read it. It says, Who may ascend the hill of the Lord? Meaning, who can approach God? Who can go into the presence of God? Who may stand in His holy place? Who's going to go to God? Who can stand in the holy place of God? Who can receive the treasures of God? This is what he said, verse 4. He who has clean hands and pure heart. What does that mean? It means someone who repents. Who does not lift up his soul to an idol or swear by it what is false. Verse 5, he says, He will receive blessings from the Lord. Meaning if you repent, you will receive the blessings of God. It's a key to the blessings of God. He will receive blessings from the Lord. And vindication, victory from God's Savior. How can you feel bad when you repent? When you think about things like that. You can go into the presence of God. You can go into the blessings of God. You can receive the blessings of God. You, uh, 
empty out your filth that is in you so that God will fill you with his blessings. How can you feel bad when you repent your sins? That's why every time I go to morning prayer or sitting in my office praying during the day or in the evening or something like that or at night, every time I repent, I feel so much joy and peace that comes from God. It's something positive, people. Okay? Something positive. Third perspective concerning... I'm not doing a good job here. Third perspective concerning repentance is this. It's a commitment. Let me put one more word into a commitment. It's a marriage commitment. It's something related to marriage commitment. Perhaps this is the most important perspective about repentance that we need to realize. What do I mean? When we confess our sins and come to the Lord so that we will receive the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ as we put our faith and trust in Jesus, what we are doing there is that we are changing our rings. Jesus gives us his life, I give him my sin. And we exchanged our rings. And now I'm married to Jesus Christ. We are brides of Jesus Christ when we receive him into our hearts. That's why when we look into the scripture, when we sin, right? Israelites, when they sinned, they were called what? They were called adulterers. Meaning when we sin, we are committing adultery against our husband, Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ. A, somebody wrote this. Let me read this sentence. A Savior who won't meddle is a phantom. And a repentance-less gospel is not good news. I cannot marry Christ and re, uh, remain married to any other. Put this way, to choose Christ and to reject others. For he is a jealous lover of our soul. That's why many times it says in the Bible, God is mentioned as a jealous God. It's not so, as if God is so jealous that he hates other people. Meaning it's emphasis on how much he loves us. Just like a jealous lover who loves us so much, we have that kind of God. And when we sin, what we are doing is we are committing spiritual adultery against God. And we are serving something else. We are having some kind of idol in our lives when we commit our sins. So when we sin, we are committing adultery. So repentance, we can say is this. Repentance is our expression of love to God. Our expression of our love to God. Caused by expression of God's love to us. Think about that. There God is generating in us repentance. Repentance is expression of our love to God. Repentance is expression of our love to God. Caused. Caused by God, right? Caused by expression of God's love to us. It's His kindness that leads us to repentance. When He does that, when we realize His love, we cannot help but to love Him. We are committed to Him. We have exchanged our vows and rings. And He is my husband forever. And I must commit myself. I cannot commit the spiritual adultery anymore. Do you remember when Simon Peter committed sins by Denying Jesus three times. I don't know Jesus. I don't know Jesus. Even to a little girl comes. Aren't you that person who used to follow Jesus? I, I don't know him. He even curses according to the Bible three times. What happens? Jesus resurrects. They're eating fish together. What does Jesus say? Jesus say, Simon Peter, do you love me? Simon Peter, do you love me? Three times. Why do you think he said that three times? Because he wants to forgive him. Because forgiveness has to do with marriage commitment. That's why Jesus asked Simon Peter, Do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? And there when Simon Peter says, I love you, Jesus. Undivided love. Nothing else do I love more than you. I love you. That's a repentance. That's the ultimate form of repentance cutting off from our sins, and giving God undivided love. It's not accident when first, and, first commandment 
of God is to love your Lord, your God, with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. And when we sin, we are violating the first commandment that God has given us, to love God with all of our hearts, minds, and soul. Fourth, think concerning repentance. Not fourth perspective. Now we go to the big point, Roman number four. Proof or result of this kind of repentance. What is the proof of repentance? If you, do I, did I genuinely repent? Did I genuinely confess my sins? What is the proof of that? What is the result of that? Let me put it in one sentence that's going to be two points. One sentence. What is the proof or result of repentance? Is this. Progressive change of life. Progressive change of life. First point is change of life. If you repent, your life will be changed. Because if you repent, when the transaction occurs in your heart and the heart of God, that love transaction, you love God and he, as He loves you, you realize His kindness and love, and you give your love back to God, your heart changes. If your heart changes genuinely, your life changes. You see, 1 John chapter, nine, uh, chapter 1 verse 9, if you confess your sins, He is faithful and just. Right? That He will not only cleanse you, but He will purify you. So, con uh, forgiveness and change of life, cleansing us, is a package deal. Okay? If you genuinely repent, change of life is a package deal. If you genuinely come to the Lord and confess your sins, you will change. Second point concerning proof and result is this. Then you may ask, then why do I keep on sinning? Does that mean I'm not repenting? Hey, you can ask the question, okay, change of life. If I repent my sins, my life will be changed. How come I keep on sinning? Does that mean I'm not a believer? Does that mean I'm not genuinely repenting or what? I've had hundreds, maybe hundreds of people come to me and ask that. Let me say this. That's why we need to have second point concerning proof and result of, uh, of repentance. Because it's a progression. It's a progressive change of life. Yeah, it's a change of life. If you repent, your life will be changed, ultimately. Be like Christ when we see Him face to face. But, in this life, it's a progressive change. As you repent, okay, your life will change, but some, many, many times, sometimes immediately, that you will stop doing something. But many, many times, most of times, in fact, slowly, that you will change. It's a progression. That's why many times we say, when we talk about this jargon, Christianity is a progression, not a perfection. When you receive perfection, you'll be disappointed. And you'll be confused. Why do I come, keep on committing the same sin when I confess my sins? I don't doubt that if you genuinely confess your sins, then you, try, you, you do your best so that you'll receive His strength and all these things. But as you go up and down in your spiritual life, you don't stay here like this if you're a genuine believer. You cannot help but to, as you go up and down, because you're struggling not to sin and struggling to grow, as you go up and down, what happens is that if you're a genuine believer, there will be progression in your spiritual life. You grow as a believer in Jesus Christ. Even in specific sin that you're con confessing and committing, as you struggle in the Lord, God, guarantee, will help you to progress from it. And sure, slowly but surely, you'll be able to uh, defeat more times than not in your life. It's a progression, not a perfection. So, we talked about repentance. Let me give some practical advice. Roman number five, practice. Just briefly, I'll briefly mention it, then we'll repent. <laughs> don't, now, don't, aren't you excited to repent? It's a key to open the heavenly door. You can be poured down upon like Amazon River feeding one daisy with the blessings of Christ. Think about that. Practice. Practical advice. Number one. You know, just basically summarizing the points that we have talked about. Number one is ask God to help you to repent. Ask for help. Lord, help me to repent. For some of you, especially who's going to church all your life, you have difficulty having devotion and love to God. 
You know why you don't have passion for God? Because you really do not realize you're a sinner before God. You know that? All your life, you've been going to church, you're goody-goody. You know, your parents didn't really, uh, you know, yell at you and didn't have to because you're goody-goody. And you come to church and you don't really have a passion. You know why? Because you really do not know how sinful you are. You really do not know the total depravity. Some in, in your mind, you may not say that, but in your mind, deepest part of your heart, you think that you deserve to be saved. You don't realize the total depravity of human beings. As you honestly go to the Lord, you realize that we are sinners before God. And it is the wonder how in the world, in this cosmos, that He can save us. Ask God to help you to repent. Number one. Okay? Number two. When you repent, repent specifically, even with little things. Okay? Specifically, and with little things. Sometimes, as you try to repent, I know this is bad, but I don't feel guilty about it. <laughs> you know, there are things like that, right? Little things. There's something, I know it's kind of bad, but, you know, it's, it's not that bad. You know, it's not that bad. As you, I say this, as you, even sometimes you, you don't mean it, right? As you con continue to confess, knowing that it is sin, continue to do that at times and ask God to help you. Lord, help me to genuinely feel this. Help me to genuinely realize that this is sin. Okay? It'll help you. Slowly but surely, it'll happen. I say this, more and more you grow spiritually, smaller and smaller sins will bother you. Okay? More and more you grow spiritually, smaller sins will bother you. Because your conscience becomes clean and clean and clean, and you get closer and closer to the Lord, and you see the light, you don't like to, you don't like the darkness anymore. As you start to have those expensive food, right? You don't want to have those, uh, McDonald's and burgers anymore, because you want to have steaks now. Just like that, as you get closer and closer to the Lord, receive the goodness and the blessings of God, what used to fill your heart, fill your time, the garbage that you used to be involved in sins, you don't like to do that anymore. Okay? You get closer and closer to the Lord, littler sins will bother you because you realize it's a filth and garbage. And as you repent more and more and grow spiritual life, Smaller sins will bother you. You know how you, you are getting away from the Lord? Do you know how you know? When the sins that you used to, sins that used to bother you don't bother you anymore. Do you know what I mean? Sins that you, you know it was bad and it used to bother you. It doesn't bother you, bother you anymore. Then you know you're spiritually fallen. Third suggestion is repent joyfully. Do it. I, every time you go to repentance, do it. Do this. Sorry, God. <laughs> you know, when you make mistake and you want to make somebody feel good. I'm just joking about it, of course. But it's a good thing. And he never, never, listen to me, guys, never rejects you. He'll never, never reject you. He doesn't like the sins in your life because he cares for you so much. He does not want you to fill yourself with garbage and filth. And He's giving you that warning sign through your red lights, dead end sign, because you're going to fall into a cliff. But when you come in repentance, He embraces you and loves you. Picture of uh, Luke chapter 15. You know, prodigal son and the father running to Him, embracing Him. Always! That's a picture of God when you repent. You have to realize that. So you joyfully go. And now you're opening the keys of that door. And He blesses you. He fills you. Every time I repent and pray for all kinds of things, at the end I always sing praises and worship and give thanks to God. And that's the best time of prayer. Just for that time I pray. You know? It's just wonderful time.
Why do you think you feel like praising God every time I finish sermon, you stand up and sing these praises? That's the best time. Why? Because now you really want to pray to God and you repent. You are cleansed through the Word of God. As you sing praises, you give thanks because you know you are accepted by God. That's where the Christian joy is, people. When you're closest to God, when you're clean, and when you stand in the presence of God as you walk into the hill of the Lord, you feel and see and know His presence. Amen? Fourth suggestion is repent constantly and consistently. Constantly and consistently. I repent all the time. You know? Just, this is my habitual prayer. Lord, as soon as I'm sitting down, I say, Lord, I'm sorry. It's not kind of bad thing, I'm a terrible guy, thing like that. Lord, I'm sorry. We always have a feeling. Hey, knowing that I'm, I know I cannot stand before God, it humbles me, gives me good attitude in worship and prayer. Knowing that I don't deserve to be in this place, help me, help me to be wholehearted. Think about it. Think about a basketball team. You know, usually when you when you see a guy who who should not make the team, make it. He's the one who's running up and down all the time. When the ball goes out of there, good guys don't want to get it. But this guy, as if he might get cut from the team if they don't like him. So he got to run and get the ball. It's a privilege for him to touch the ball kind of thing. If we realize that I'm sorry to God, when, when I know that I have that attitude in my heart, I always feel like worshiping God with all of my heart. Number five, key in repentance and key to sanctification and spiritual growth and everything is your relationship with God okay it's your relationship with God that's a key when you are closer to the Lord smaller things will bother you okay you're close to the holy person the holiest person in this universe smaller things will start to bother you as you are closer and closer to the Lord you will be able to repent more and you'll feel the joy of repentance. You'll have different eyes, different perspective, and you can see the smaller things that bothers you. Number six is this. Now, I picture it sometimes when I don't feel like I'm, uh, uh, I'm forgiven. I picture it like this. Picture Jesus on the cross. Seven, uh, sixth suggestion, last but not least. Picture Jesus on the cross. You know, close your eyes and picture him. You're going to feel like repenting. I do that all the time. But I don't stop there. I do a few things when I picture Jesus on the cross. First of all, I give load, my load to him. If you haven't read Pilgrim's Progress, classic book, uh, second bestseller after the Bible in this world, Pilgrim's Progress. When you have time during some kind of vacation, pick up and read it. It'll, give, it'll teach you so much truth concerning Christian life. And probably climax of the book, Pilgrim's Progress, is, is uh, the Christian. That's his name in the book. It's a story by John Bunyan. Christian goes to the slight hill, and he's carrying this load all the time. But at the foot of the cross, he lays all his burden down. And now he's free. He's hopping around in joy. And that's, that's what I picture myself. Whenever I have guilt and whenever I sin, I picture Jesus on the cross. And what I do is I lay down at the foot of the cross. And then what I do is that I see him cleansing me. You know, just washing me with the po most powerful detergent. I feel like I'm a little kid who played in the mud. I come to Daddy, Father. And he cleanses me with the most powerful detergent with his blood. I see him cleansing. And then another thing that I do as I picture cross is this. I see, I make sure, I focus on, and I see the blood of Jesus. Because he says to me on the cross, as I see his blood, he goes, go and sin no more. Go and sin no more. It's because of your sin. Okay? It's because of my sin that he's bleeding. 
it makes me realize that it hurts God for me to sin. And there is the basis of all of our forgiveness and repentance. And we receive all the wonderful treasures and blessings of God when we repent. So why don't we repent? I have no idea. Let's pray. As you close your eyes and just listen to me for a few minutes. Lately, uh, I want to confess to you that lately I, I felt kind of dry spiritually. And I felt like, you know, something was up, something was off in my spiritual life. What I realized through the break you know, spring break, although I read a lot of things and things like that, but what I realized during the spring break, because I didn't have to do much except one retreat, during, the, during those days, what I realized that because I didn't have to do much, I really didn't think about the Lord, really didn't have that attitude of going to the Lord and seeking Him. So what I realized between this, this, this week was that my heart was divided. I felt like my heart was divided. There was not undivided devotion to God. So guess what I did? I sat down and repented. I said, sorry, Lord, for having, looking at other husbands in my marriage dedicated to you. I'm sorry. I'm going to have undivided love for my husband. I'm going to have undivided love for you once again and when I repented <laughs> he ran to me and embraced me filled me with joy once again and with conviction power goodness mercy kindness I know I'm accepted and loved maybe some of you are like that you may be a perfectly good person outside, but in your heart you are divided in your devotion to God. Maybe you need to repent. Come to the relationship with the Lord again and say, Lord, I'm going to have undivided love for you. Next two weeks, in two weeks we have Good Friday, day that we celebrate Jesus' death and resurrection. We have two weeks. To me, it's more important weekend than Christmas, birth of Jesus. Death and resurrection of Jesus is more important to me. I think it ought to be for Christians. So maybe for two weeks, you better repent and have some undivided love and devotion to God. Prepare your hearts. Whatever captures your mind, you try to quit that. Cut that down and go to God in your undivided attention and devotion to God in repentance. Maybe you need to fast. Maybe you need to pray more. I don't know what it is. Maybe you need to just give undivided attention and devotion to God in your mind especially. Whatever captures your mind will capture your heart. Okay? Maybe you need to rededicate your life to the jealous lover of your soul. I'm going to do that for next week, two weeks and perhaps more. Maybe some of you need to do that. Can, is there anybody who would like to do that? That you like to rededicate your heart so that you have undivided attention and devotion to God. Just raise your hand and pray to the Lord. Just raise your hand. Okay. A lot of you, just raise your hand. You can put your hand down and just pray to the Lord right now. Okay? Let's pray to the Lord for a few minutes.